All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Facebook Live. My name is Sarah, and today we are diving into the Lepsil 510 Discussion Board MVP. Thank you all so much for joining us today, whether you are here with us live or watching the replay. And with that, I'll go ahead and kick things over to your academic director, uh, Dr. Eric Fritzfold. Thanks. Sarah, thanks so much, and I echo her warm welcome to everyone in law enforcement and public safety, whether you're Lepsil students or not, joining us live or on the replay. And for a little bit of context before I introduce our special guest here, um, I think I would argue that our discussion boards are truly the heartbeat of our program. We work really hard to keep our curriculum contemporary and immediately useful. We've recruited, I believe, the best academic law enforcement practitioner faculty in the country. But it's really these interactive student discussion boards that um, really help us achieve the mission of the program. So it's bringing together diverse professionals, different ranks, different agencies um, from across the country and beyond to engage the issues of the day, the challenges and the opportunities. And that's why students like this who really make everything around them better, really deserve this time and this recognition. So with that as the context, please uh, join me in welcoming our discussion board MVP winner for the Lepsil 510 Communication Skills for Law Enforcement Leaders course, a lieutenant with the Culver City Police Department, Lieutenant Luis Martinez. Uh, Luis, congratulations. Thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Thank you, Professor Fitzwell. I'm glad to be here. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to dive right in, if that's all right, Lieutenant. Let's do it. All right. So uh, you bring 19 years of diverse experience to the program, currently serving, uh, overseeing the professional standards unit. But you've served as a watch commander in patrol with the traffic section. Earlier in your career, you worked patrol. You've been an FTO. You were on the crime impact team, special enforcement team, and a narcotics task force, all in roughly two decades. Um, in this particular course, we studied a wide variety of different types of communication skills. Thinking about your diverse career, was there a, a topic or particular communications issue that stood out to you as being particularly useful? Ooh, good question. Um, I would probably have to say the one where we, we, we learned about mediums in uh, those different scenarios. I want to say it was either module two or module three. Um, those i think it was four scenarios one was like a feel-good story officers rescue someone from a fire um officers are playing softball with a softball team at a high school then there was a critical incident with a really bad use of force and then the last one i believe was like a vocal speech from a poa president at a city council meeting so those scenarios and then we had to write in uh, an mou or a memo to our chief outlining how we would uh, explain those incidents or address them if you will and when I read it, I'm like, these four incidents have, they haven't occurred here at, at my organization, but they had similar type incidents. So I think for a, a, a Lepsil student who maybe isn't familiar with uh, releasing um, information or communicating certain scenarios or information to the public or even internally, those scenarios, that assignment um, really stood out to me because use of force critical incident hot topic in law enforcement yeah. and students get to see how or learn how to deliver that message to the community um you know explaining how you know trust transparency is important holding people accountable respecting due process with employees uh same goes for um, the feel good stories i mean let's face it uh, bad news sells um, right. they make the news more than the good ones so whenever we do have good positive stories it's important for organizations to share them to show that you know we, we genuinely care about the community and these, this is just a small snippet of what we're doing and then last but not least the one on the the union one and that one was an interesting one because for those who haven't been on a union some students haven't um i spent a significant part of my officer and sergeant career in the union and the poa and now on the management side and it's a very fine tricky issue for the chief to navigate you know freedom of speech union rights and then at the same time community uh, engagement and perception so we've had similar types of uh, scenarios here at our organization and our chief has done a good job of delivering that message um so that module that topic uh really stood out to me i, th I think i hope and I, I think most of the students took a lot from it okay that's cool that's how you address these scenarios good good to know 
Fantastic and great memory, by the way. And I really appreciate you highlighting that assignment because yeah. that's really the theory of our program. Let's give students who maybe haven't had the opportunity to do those things professionally, let's do some practice in a low stakes environment. Like, yes, right. you're earning a grade for that assignment, but compared to having to do that if you're a, a new PIO for your agency, isn't it better to get some practice in academia with some coaching and feedback before you maybe really have to do it in a time pressure situation for your chief or sheriff or something like that. So you I have appreciate to create a, like a press release or something like that. It, yeah. it comes in, it may fall on your lap next month and at least you know how to address it. That's our theory. I appreciate you highlighting that. Um, so doing my prep work for this interview, I worked through all your discussion board posts from the previous course and you made an argument that really resonated with me, Lieutenant, which was that communications kind of like what you just spoke to is is critically important in modern law enforcement internally with the community with stakeholders but it's also a perishable skill and that uh like any skill needs to be repeated often and practiced often and nurtured and enhanced quite deliberately and you shared that your your agency recognizes that and now conducts interviews for all specialized positions talk about the importance of communication um, can you share a little bit about that? Where did that come from? How long have y'all been doing it? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm a firm believer that communication skills are, they are perishable. It's like markmanship skills, if you're a DUI cop, DUI skills, they're all perishable. If you don't practice them, they're going to be rusty. And so what ended up happening was we were having interviews for sergeants. And so I had officers coming to me and they'd be, hey, LT, I'm, I'm testing for sergeant. Can I pick your brain about the interview, the, the promotional process? And what we were seeing in sitting some of these uh, these panels was the skills were rusty and uh, they weren't all there. So what our department did, and I think what some departments were already doing is in the past for us, if you want to test for a specialized assignment, you'd submit a, mem a memorandum um, of uh, to the chief of, of interest and it would go up the chain of command and people would provide their, their input and then a selection was made. So what we did was we, we changed course and now in order to test for F FTO, detective, all specialized assignments, you have to take an interview. Because what we were discovering is officers were 10 or 12 years. The last time they took an interview was when they applied for the job a decade ago. Wow. So they were rusty. So at least this one, they have now they have two or three or four interviews under their belt. Um, we were bringing in an outside raider. So now that way they had that curveball of now I got to communicate to a stranger, so to speak. So yeah, I do feel communication skills are perishable. And one thing I encourage my my peers, my the other students were, don't fear what you don't know. And so you work on your communication skills. And what I meant by that was, if you aren't on a union, if you aren't on a committee, do something to practice your communication skills. If you join a POA, some pe may, people may frown on it. I didn't because you were gonna be talking to community members, uh, city council, city manager. You were gonna be talking to city hall officials. I mean, what better place to practice your communication skills? especially when contract negotiations come around, that's huge. Um, or next month, I think, I'm sorry, uh, later this month, we have our Citizens Police Academy. Now that COVID's kind of subsided, we're bringing that back. I think most people, most uh, organizations are bringing it back. Um, great place to practice your communication skills. So I'm, I'm gonna be teaching internal affairs. In the past, I taught uh, um, laws of arrest, search and seizure. I taught it with my chief back when he was a lieutenant. Great place to learn your communication skills. So don't shy away from, from that type of thing. Be honest with you, it was many, many years ago, a, a mentor of mine said, hey, I actually came to him and said, hey, I, I wanna go to career day, my daughter's school and talk about a career day. And he said, go for it. He goes, uh, that's where you're gonna learn your communication skills, trying to talk to some 10 year olds. <laughs> um, and be honest with you, I did that a couple of times and he was absolutely right. Yeah. So try to find ways or um, roles where you can practice your communication skills because you'd be surprised how many uh, police professionals have a fear of public speaking yeah. um, in class or just in general, and they get nervous on interviews, uh, practice and join, join uh, committees or do roles that are going to improve your communication skills. I love that um, advice to deliberately push yourself out of your comfort zone and seek out opportunities to work on our weaknesses. That's Absolutely. professional advice we should all take. So speaking of sharpening those skills, uh, kind of rewinding a little bit here on you, Lieutenant. Uh, earlier in your career, you earned a master's degree in public administration. So you already had a master's degree 
when you started the Lepsil program? What motivated you to get, I mean, you know, we've worked together long enough. I know you're a high achiever and a go-getter, but what, what motivated you to come back and get a second master's here from USD? Ooh, good question. Um, you know what? I was kind of like, uh, I was, it was kind of unique. When I graduated high school, I went to the local community colleges and completed my, um, my undergrad studies. And then I got hired by the police department. And then I did that for a few years, but I, I was fortunate enough that a mentor took me under his wing and said, Hey kid, you need to go get your degree. And I advise you to get your master's degree. And here's why always have a fallback plan, always have something else in case God forbid you get hurt, something to fall back on, back on with a master's degree. So when I, I had about two or three years on the job, and then when I was about 26, I got my, my BA. And then a couple of years later, I kept going, got my, my master's in public administration. So it's been about 12 years since I was last in school. And <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a firm believer that, you know, in lifelong learning, yeah. you can never stop learning. And so I think you made a comment once that you said, hey, uh, you know, USD is one of, the, I think it was your president or your chancellor. Mm -hmm. He actually teaches a course and he's, you know, a continuing um, professional, if you will. Yeah. And so I was like, man, that resonated with me in the sense that I wanted to go back to school to sharpen my skills, add some something new to my toolbox. Um, a lot of my my peers, my uh, my partners here at the department had been through USD. They highly recommended it. Um, and so I, th I thought, why not? I, I looked into it. I liked what I saw. And, and that's why I made the jump. And a lot, to be honest with you, a lot of the material uh, I can relate to. And even some of the stuff that I'm, 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 uh, I'm learning, budget, I didn't know about too much. I wasn't too familiar with before. So the budget class we had, where we had to put the budget process, that was a lengthy process. Yeah. That was uh, eye-opening. I, I had to spend some days with my financial management analyst here at the department and go over things. But it just, it opened my eyes to and opened doors to different things that I didn't, maybe didn't see before. That's fantastic. And not to take us on too much of a tangent, but uh, I really respect that our university president, President Harris, he teaches an undergraduate leadership class. So right. he sits in person with a room of, I think they're 18, 19, and 20 disproportionately at that time. Um, and I think about what his day must look like, you know, donors, boards of trustees, vision, you know, he's the head of a pretty large organization. Right. Um, talk about leading from the front. I think it's a really, right. really good example for us to follow. But, but speaking of your agency here, um, Lieutenant, I want to take this moment to really thank you, the legacy of students from your agency and Culver City Police Department as a whole. Uh, your agency continues to put just top-notch students into Lepsil time and time again, many of whom I continue to lean on, you know, when I have a curriculum question or there's lots of things that happen in Lepsil, uh, an OIS response. Those are things I don't have experience with. I, I tend to lean on people from your agency for some guidance, among others. I uh, had the chance to, to spend a day visiting and touring your agency, which was really, really cool for me. Education seems to be particularly important, um, and you've created this culture. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Why, why is education so prominent and, and professional development so prominent in your agency? Um, well, when I started back in 03, um, there was a handful of guys who had degrees. Um, I was fortunate enough to have some guys take me under their wing that had uh, advanced degrees, graduate degrees. Uh, one had a, a law degree and he was a practicing law attorney on the side. And uh, they always you know, stressed education. Fast forward, I'd say in the last maybe 10 to 12 years, it's ramped up even more. So our chief is, is someone who has a, a master's degree. He, he ended up getting a master's degree, degree right around the time I got mine, maybe about 10 years ago. And I counted, I think this morning out of our management group, which is 12 of us, lieutenants and above, um, 11 have a master's degree. Um, one, one doesn't have it. Um, so that's, that's pretty impressive. I think the chief stresses education. It's something we pride ourselves on, but it also trickles down to the, uh, the sergeant ranks and even the officer's ranks. We really, really stress education. You mentioned culture. That's another key thing. Uh, our, our department in our city values uh, education. And what I mean by that is we have a very, very, very generous tuition reimbursement program. And so that, I think, helps motivate some students to go back to school with a financial cost. So that, that obviously helps. We have financial incentives that if you earn a degree, you get more pay. That also helps. 
And then what ended up happening is you started seeing the job flyers for promotional process and you would see BA or MA or MS highly desired. I think most of us understand what highly desirable means. Um, you're going to, it's going to catch some attention. That's what we're looking for. So what we've noticed is a lot of our police officers getting degrees and sergeants getting degrees. Um, it helps them during the promotional process, but it's just become a, a cultural thing. I, it's, it's kind of be honest with you, like expecting now that once you promote the higher you promote, you should have an advanced degree. Wow. And kind of back to the President Harris example, talk about leading from the front, your chief and your command staff with with almost 100 percent advanced degrees. And what a great message that your agency invests back, I think, as we as a society ask more and more of you as law enforcement professionals. Right. Your umbrella of responsibility is getting wider. It's not getting more narrow. Um, how great that your agency and your city supports education and professional development and realizes we have to position people to succeed if we're asking so much of them. Just, and also setting a good example. I mean, yeah. me personally, um, I did it for, you know, to set a good example for my kids. Um, my wife's an attorney, so she was extremely uh, supportive and appreciative of that. But then uh, on the flip side, professionally, it's also setting a good example for the officers who maybe are a year, year and a half away from getting a degree. If they can see a, a, a sergeant or a lieutenant um, getting after it and getting their degree, you know they're kind of like you know when i motivate them like hey go back to school get your degree i think it resonates a little bit more i appreciate that very much let's let's talk about the family example here for a minute lieutenant if you don't mind like most people in lepsel you have diverse responsibilities you have a, a demanding and unpredictable day job you have family commitments in a thriving you know personal life and a little inside knowledge here. I know that you're part of the prestigious post command college all at the same time. So how do you balance work, life, family, school? And, and clearly you're, you're an award winner here. So you're, you're thriving. Um, how do you uh, execute all those tasks? You know, one thing that I've learned is over the years, time management, it's all about time management. And so I'm very uh, particular. I'm, I'm usually up by four. 4.15, I'm out the door by no later than 4.30. I'm at the station at five. I work out for an hour, um, take a shower, and I, I, I try to be at my desk at 7 a.m. and I try to get out of here by five. Um, but I, I make very, very, very good use of my time. So for example, this morning driving into work, my 30 minute drive, um, pulled up my phone before I took off and I listened to the media videos on the public safety law class. So I'm listening to them as I'm driving. For those of you that live in Southern California, know the 405 or the 60 freeway going east at 5 p.m., it can get bad. So going home, I do the same thing. I'll get the articles that you guys uh, have us read. I'll upload them to uh, an app, an app called Speechify. It, it converts text to audio. Yeah. And I'll listen to it driving home that hour. So I take, I make very good use of my time. Um, and then I set aside time. I on my weekends, my days off. I'm up early before the kids are up. Um, I do my discussion boards and then I do my, you know, do my assignment on Friday and Saturday. So that way, like by 10 or 11 AM, the rest of my day is clear on my, on my days off and I can devote it to, you know, going to my kids' soccer games or, or what have you, family obligations, going to a ball game or what have you, but yeah. it's all about time management. Sorry about that. Oh, um, um, we work with law enforcement professionals, turns out. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's all about time management. Yeah. So you gotta be, you gotta set aside time. And you know this 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 course this program requires I'd say between 15, 18, maybe 20 hours. So if you can plan your day, do your discussion board questions for an hour, read people's posts, comment, you know, do your homework assignment. If you can do that strategically over seven days, you're good. And then I I combine that with Command College. Um, again, my chief is very very supportive of furthering one's education as well as professional development. So he factors in that I have Command Command College to deal with as well. So they afford me time to do that. But one thing, one thing that I do want to address with Eric, and I'm pretty sure a lot of students are in the same boat that I am, is I have a very, very supportive family. In, in my case, my wife. Um, my wife has a busy schedule herself. She is a practicing attorney here in LA County, a district deputy district attorney, and she holds it down at the house. Yeah. Taking the uh, the youngest to you know practices, soccer, dance, jazz, you name it. Um, they help out a lot. So my wife will be like, hey, the dad's going to go do his homework for an hour, an hour or two. Let's go to this room. And so they help me out a lot. 
um, they, they, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for them. And so I definitely want to, they're the, they're the real MVP. To be honest with you. <laughs> I appreciate you highlighting that. And, uh, I, I say this at graduation often that our real constituents, uh, no offense, Lieutenant, aren't you the student, it, it's your families. And that we work so hard on this program to make sure when we, you know, uh, ask a student to sacrifice that time away, Right. That we need to make sure that the program is beneficial enough to give that back to your family with promotions, with skill set advancement, that five years later, folks are so happy that that person, that you all collectively made that sacrifice because it betters your family as a whole. That's at least, right. you know, our mission is that we really serve your family as a whole, not just you, the student. Um, and to, to circle back to that discussion, oh, and, and one more thing, I really hope our current and future students heard you about downloading things on a mobile device and listening to them in traffic. Uh, I use that same strategy. I'll, uh, I'll watch a, a video in a professional environment first, and then I'll watch it a second time, or I'll listen to it a second time while I'm walking the dog or while I'm in traffic and uh, trying to make the best use of my time, like you said. Absolutely. Um, to drill down a little bit on the discussion boards, when students vote for you, not only did you get the most votes, but they also get to provide a, a short blurb or a rationale about why they casted a vote. And going through those, here were some themes that, that your peers really respected about your work on the discussion board, your high level of engagement, your responsiveness. But one of the themes that really stuck out with me was um, the mix of substantively strong posts with a pretty human and, and even uh, humoristic flair that a lot of students pointed out that your posts were substantively strong, but like welcoming and funny. So as a question, you know, how do you find that balance? And again, in reviewing your work, like your substance was bulletproof, course material, bring to bear great examples from your professional experience, right? The substance was tight, but you had this knack for being warm and welcoming and funny and I think encouraging dialogue. How do you find that balance? Well, I've always had a, a good sense of humor. I, uh, I've been told, hey, you're a funny guy. You, you have a good sense of humor. So in our line of work, especially especially in the last couple of years with everything that law enforcement has gone through with, you name it, defunding, anti-police rhetoric, uh, civil unrest, the pandemic, you name it. Um, now more than ever, it's you know, especially as you promote higher, you know, the, the troops look up to you, you want them to feel uh, welcome, like warm and welcome. And you want to embrace them, so to speak. You don't want to be that type where they stay away from you. And for me, like you mentioned earlier, I work professional standards, otherwise known as IA. Yeah, so sir. coming to my office, they're looking at me. So whenever we do talk a lot about work, it's usually because I'm investigating an allegation of misconduct. So that being said, I've always been a very personable uh, person. Um, I feel that you can get more out of people. You can really you just, there's nothing wrong with treating people with, with, you know, respect and just, you know, getting to know them. And I, a good example that I like to use, I, I like to use sports when I give uh, examples or what have you, like Bill Belichick, taskmaster, very hardcore, but gets results. No one can argue that the man doesn't get results. He does. Yeah. But if you're noticed over the last five years, maybe more, it's the more personable guys, I hate to say it, by a guy like Sean McVay, who relates more to his player, a guy like Pete Carroll, who can engage, are more engaging and get more out of their troops that way. So that's how I try to lead uh, my personnel um, when I'm at work, eh, even outside of work with my kids. But I try to be more personable, more engaging. I think I get more out of them that way. Um, and you know, they, I respect them and they, they respect me. And, and in this assignment, especially when an investigation is done, uh, I've yet to hear anyone say, man, you treated me poorly. You, it's, it's usually quite the opposite. And I try to relate, find, give an example, maybe some experience or expertise that they can relate to. And they can be like, oh, okay, okay. I get it. I appreciate you taking the time. No one's ever done that for me. So forth and so forth. So wow. I think that goes a long way. Yeah. Strong agree for me and, and really sage leadership strategies that I appreciate you highlighting. And, and again, I just want to commend you on, um, you know, I think it's easy to be light and funny in a discussion board post, but not have substance. And I think it's easy to have strong substance that reads like a encyclopedia entry. You did a great job. Um, 
I can see why your peers voted for you so enthusiastically because mm -hmm. you know you just nurtured conversation in, in such a great way. I'm gonna, you know, quite frankly, try to follow that example a little bit more myself. Um, as we're kind of winding down here, speaking of discussion board engagement, going through your work, it's common for Lepsil students to go over and above what we ask of them with course requirements between you, me, and the viewers here. Um, having taught undergrads my whole life, we, when we first started Lepsil, we had page minimums. So this assignment has to be three pages minimum. Right. And we quickly learned we better have page maximums because, you know, folks in your profession tend to be highly motivated and highly engaged. So going through your work on the discussion boards, you and quite a few of your classmates, as you know, we require three posts in a week. And it was common to see 15, 16, 17, 18 posts from an individual student engaging in this dialogue throughout the week. So my question for you is, you were in that grade on Tuesday or Wednesday. You would check the box on the discussion board grade for the week. What motivated you to come back a, a dozen more times? Well, um, like anything in life, it's, uh, it's what you make of it. You know, Whatever you put into this program is what you're going to get out of it. And so I've never been the type where I've gone to a class or I've been in a classroom where I've gone to some kind of leadership training or what have you, some training class. And I just sit there and I just sit there and don't say a word. That's never been me. Um, you've seen me at command college. I'm not the yes, one sir. raising my hand and, and, and talking a lot. But what I do like to do is I like to listen. I like to hear what people have to say. I take notes and maybe in class I'll pull, uh, I'll pull aside a, a classman and be like, hey, you, you mentioned this. And then I'll start talking and engaging them that way and trying to see what they meant by that or, or getting further. So in these discussion board posts, uh, I didn't want to be, uh, I'm not that guy. And I didn't want to be that guy where I just one post, um, I commented on two more students posts and I'm done for the week. I wanted to get more out of it. And also it was funny last week, I think it was, I was looking at our roster, our, my department's personnel roster. And I noticed that out of the 109 sworn that we have, I want to say almost 50% have five years or less so what that means is we're a very very young department and i'm pretty sure that's that's probably the norm across with other departments as well and so lepso was no different there was a lot of uh junior or less tenured students there was a couple of handful of lieutenants maybe a captain on my last class we had a chief but i'll be honest with you uh, eric i i got a lot out of the the younger students and what they were posting because it's a new generation and I'm leading that generation. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to it and I want to engage them. I want to see what make what makes them tick. And why do you look at things that way? Why do you feel this way about certain things? Oh, okay. And a lot of them, a lot of them really brought up things that I really didn't see or maybe understand. And these were two, three, four year cops. Um, one was a probation officer up, up, in, up north, all, all different types of students. So how do you find out about that? Uh, how do you get that information? You participate. So I would go, if, if I saw a post from a, a two-year deputy from Orange County who posted something, something, you know, that caught my, my, piqued my interest, I would respond back, hey, you know, great post. What did you mean by that? Or I agree with that. Hey, hey, that's very good insight on your part. I'm impressed that you would be thinking that with your, your tenure. So again, it's, it's, you're going to get what you, you know, you put in. So if you're just going to, I encourage the students not to be the minimus guy, just do the bare minimum, um, be engaged, ask. Um, you have 25 students approximately. And we had a school, a school uh, police chief on our last class, the communication guys. He was a, from Texas, I believe. Yes, sir. His name's Scott Collins. And what better guy to pick his brain than, uh, you know, with unfortunately with Uvalde happening, yeah. we were picking that guy's brain in class you know, on his post. That was invaluable in, in my opinion. We had a couple captains, one from San Jose, they provide a tremendous um, insight. So again, if how are you going to get that info? You don't get it unless you ask or comment on people's posts. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And one of our theories, and you know, early on when we launched Lepsil, I guess we didn't know what we didn't know. And I remember a particular conversation with with two folks at at your level of experience who were saying that it's so helpful for them to get a candid frontline perspective in class because they can't always get it at work that Absolutely. the academic environment and being from separate agencies maybe encourages uh, a more free dialogue or maybe a, a third year person wouldn't be comfortable sharing something um 
as directly in their own agency with their own superiors. So we hope that that academic environment kind of nurtures those good conversations. And uh, I, I appreciate you highlighting that here, Lieutenant. Uh, you're welcome. So as we wind down here, we've covered a lot of great ground. Uh, any final thoughts for our, our law enforcement and public safety leadership community here, Lieutenant Martinez? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I just want to thank you and, and Sarah and Abby, Abby Oliver. She's I've had a, a, I've reached out to her several times. And she's been really super helpful. Uh, thank you guys for putting together a, a really top notch, solid program. Um, and I don't just I'm not just saying that. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know I've I've referred. Uh, few of yes, my uh, my officers and sergeants your way um to your program i i think a lot of it um to the students you know just you know never stop learning don't fear what you don't know and just keep trying to get better educate yourself train yourself but then most importantly i just had a conversation with one student that i'm going to send your way and he was asking me about it and i said listen man you're going to get what you put it you're going to get out of it what you put in but more importantly when you earn this degree all the material you're learning in this lepso program it's going to be uh, relatable, especially as you promote to a sergeant, but apply it. If you're just going to get this degree hanging on your wall and you'd be happy with that, okay. Uh, but I encourage you to actually apply it daily in your job. And if you can do that, um, then you're, you're maximizing the value of, of, of a USD uh, education. So that's, um, you know, I'll leave you with that. But thank you guys uh, very much. Well, Thank you very much for the kind words. I couldn't think of a better place to leave this interview, but just once again, I want to thank you. And again, so many of your colleagues at Culver City for really helping shape this program. And again, just kind of making everything around you better. So it's really students like you that have made the program appreciate what it. it is. And so we're deeply appreciative. And uh, and Sarah, I'm passing the baton officially over to you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you both so much for hopping on and for your time today. And thank you to all who are watching live or everyone who's watching the replay. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join us and we'll see you next time.